It's a wonderful world. It's a wonderful world. Come on, say it's a wonderful world. Man, this has been an awesome series. How many have got in on some of the Wonderful World series? I tell you, if you haven't, you need to make sure you go back before I get started. I just wanna thank Pastor Ashley and Pastor Paul. Come on, can we give it up for our pastors? Just such an honor and a privilege to serve underneath you guys and in this house. We're so thankful for you. We pray Pastor Paul comes back safely and energized and ready to go. But uh, as he texted me and asked me to fill in this weekend and we're talking about a wonderful world, uh, I, I didn't dare touch Ruth because I'm telling you, he has been bringing such powerful revelation from the book of Ruth. And if you haven't got the chance to see it, go back on YouTube and watch those two because I'm telling you, it's been just truly powerful and you're gonna wanna get those. And so I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna let him come back and finish as the Lord leads him. Uh, but we are gonna stay in the theme of a wonderful world. And so I began this week to, to think and, and pray and study, and I was just thinking about that phrase, a wonderful world, and my mind went back to elementary. And how many, how many remember some elementary school? Come on. I know it's been a while for some of us, but uh, I remember elementary school, and we may not have known it at that time, but how many of you know, in elementary, it was a wonderful world. You didn't have to think about much. You didn't worry about anything. Food just showed up. Uh, Christmas gifts just showed up. And it was a wonderful world. And so I began to just think about that, and, and God just began to expand on it. And I remember when I was a young child, I had three older brothers uh, that were six, eight, and 10 years older than I am. And so they trained me a lot of things, and, and they spoiled me in a lot of things. But uh, we would play football out in the, the yard, and uh, for a while, they would let me win, but when I started to get in those elementary years, they, they didn't let me win as much. In fact, a lot of times when I made a mistake, they really made me pay for it. How many's ever been around some family like that? Yeah, and so I, I learned to play, and, and they really was preparing me for life, and so I learned to play. Well, then I got into elementary school, and we're playing football on the playground, and something really weird happened. Uh, I was pumped up because my brothers had been training me, so I was like, it's game on now, I'm ready to go. And so I was playing defense one day, and the quarterback drops back to pass, and I'm telling you, my back pedal was on point, I was ready to go, and he throws the ball, and I break on the ball, and I pick it off, and I mean, I've got a pick six. I'm headed to the end zone. And so I'm running with the ball, and all of a sudden, the quarterback yells, do over! And I went, do, do what? And he said, do over, and all of the kids stopped running, and they went back to the line of scribbage, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? What's a do-over? And apparently, if you make a mistake on the playground, you can just yell do-over, and you get to do it again. And I was like, man, that's a wonderful world right there. How many would like to yell do-over at work tomorrow? <laughs> but I thought, man, that's just wild. And, but then, it didn't stop in elementary school. We haven't, even as an adult, how many have been on the golf course and you hit a bad shot and you get a what? You get a mulligan. It's an adult version of do over. And I began to think about this and God began to really expand it in my heart. And I said, you know, it would be a wonderful world if we get do overs. And God says, I do give you do overs. And I began to just seek his face on this. And I'm telling you, he took me to the word of God and he began to show me some powerful things. Come on, are you believing with me today? And so let's go to the word. Let's go to Exodus chapter six. Amen, we get excited about the word of God here. Exodus chapter six, and we're gonna hear about Moses who at this point was 80 years old. And uh, that's a good word for some of you. Think, some of you think, well, I've, I'm already past that time and uh, you know, I'm retired, it's time for the next generation. Hey, there's no retirement in the Bible. Uh, God's not finished with you yet. And, and Moses was tending the flock up on the mountain at 80 years old and he was doing what he was supposed to do in the place he was supposed to be and he has an encounter with God. 
Come on, we could preach for a long time just right there on that. It's not over for you, no matter how old you are. And if you're in the right place at the right time, you're gonna have an encounter with God. And he's on this mountain, and all of a sudden, something catches his eye. There's a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up. And his curiosity gets him, and so he goes over to see the bush. And out of the bush comes the voice of God, and, and God gives him a, a great assignment that he's supposed to do. And he tells him, he says, I want you to go before Pharaoh because my people Israel have been in bondage there and I've heard their cry and I've remembered my covenant and I want to deliver them. And Moses, I'm sending you to go before Pharaoh to deliver my people. So he gets this huge assignment from God. How I mean, you know, that's a big deal. So he goes before Pharaoh and he's heard God, he's obeying God, and he steps up and he says, Pharaoh, I want you to let the people go that we may go into the wilderness and worship God. And he goes, God who? And no, you're not going anywhere. And at that point, I would have probably said, okay, wait a minute. God said, go before Pharaoh and lead my people out. I, I heard and I obeyed, but all of a sudden I get a no answer. And I'm sure at that point, Moses feels like a failure because you know he had an assignment. He says, I'm on it. I go do it, but the result didn't show up. And so I'm sure his head's down. I'm sure he feels like he's failed. And I'm sure he probably wanted to quit like a lot of us sometimes wanna do. We wanna quit. But then God shows up. And Exodus chapter six is probably one of my favorite pages of the Bible. Because God gives Moses and he gives us a revelation about who he is that forever changed my life. And I want you to hear this. So his head's down, he's, he's seemingly failed and listen to what God says. Exodus chapter six, verse two. And God spoke unto Moses and said to him, I am Jehovah the Lord. He says, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. Man, that's the big three right there. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By my name El Shaddai, or God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, I was not known to them. Now right there, my Bible Rolodex went off, and I knew that Abraham on the mountain, when he was offering up Isaac, he was about to offer him up, and all of a sudden, God turns his attention to the ram caught in the thicket, and Abraham said this, he said, Jehovah Jireh. So he knew the word, but right here it says, they did not know me as Jehovah. Is it possible to know the name, but not know the power behind the name? Is it possible to know about the person, but not really have relationship? And so he said, I'm about to show you, Moses, a whole new side of me. He says, I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. And that's a God Almighty, a God that's able to do anything that he wants to do. I want us to vote in here today. How many believe that God can do anything that he wants to do? Let me see your hand. All right, that's, I believe, almost every hand in here. We all believe that he's able to do anything that he wants to do. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew that side of God, but they didn't know this one. He said, but by my name, Jehovah, I was not known to them. Matthew Henry defines Jehovah this way. This is a really good to get in your notes because note takers are... History makers, Jehovah is a God performing what he had promised and so inspiring confidence in his promises. A God performing what he had promised and so inspiring confidence in his promises. He says, you've known me as a God that's able to do it, but now you're about to see me as not just a God that's able, but a God that's going to perform it in your life. And I want you to listen to what he says. He says, I've heard the cries of my people. Verse six, Exodus 6, 6. He says, therefore say to the children of Israel, I am Jehovah. He says, I will. Come on, shout, I will. He says, I will. Every time you see I will out there, up there on the screen, I want you to shout it with me. He says, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians and I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments and I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burden of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am Jehovah. Seven times 
He says, I'm not just a God that's able to do it. I'm a God that will do it. A while ago, I had you vote, and almost every hand went up that I believe God's able to do anything that he wants to do. But here's the real rub. A lot of us know he's able, but we question, will he do it for me? I've seen him do it in other people's lives, but will he do it for me? And God's saying, hey, I'm gonna settle it once and for all. I'm not just the God that's able. I'm a God that wants to do it in your life. I'm a God that will do it in your life. And Moses, it might have looked like you failed. It might look like it's over. It might look like you wanna quit and give up. But he says, I'm about to show you not just a God that's able. I'm gonna show you a God that will. You know, it's one thing. Uh, I may have the, the money in my bank account to go buy Pastor Juan a brand new Lexus. Are you in on that one? He's in on that one. But I might have the ability, but how many you know, I have to also want to do it. Pastor Juan believes I want to. But he's a man of great faith right there. But it's not just having the ability, you have to also want to. And the flip side of the coin is also right, because this is really reality. I would love to go buy him a Lexus, but I don't have the ability to do it. So either way, you gotta have both because I could have the ability, but if I don't want to, he doesn't get it. Or I could want to, but if I don't have the ability, he still doesn't get it. You gotta have someone that has the ability to do it and the want to do it. And that's our God. And I'm telling you, this passage transformed my life forever because I always knew him as a God that was able, but I questioned a lot of time, will he do it for me? And he says, I'm settling it once and for all. It might have looked like you failed, but I'm a God that's gonna be with you and I'm a God that's gonna bring this to pass. Come on, someone say amen to that. But you might be like him. You've had an assignment and it looks like you failed. And so he's telling Moses, he says, go back in there. And so Moses goes back before Pharaoh a second time. And guess what? No. Third time, no. He went back multiple times before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh kept saying no, 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 no. But once you've got an assignment from God, you can't let anything in the natural move you. You gotta say, I'm not gonna quit. I'm not gonna give up. I might need a do-over, but right now, my God's faithful, and he's gonna be there with me and bring me through this situation. And here's what is the real big thing is you gotta have the maturity to stay with it once you've heard it. You gotta stay with it because what God was really doing, come on, get ready. What God was really doing is every time Pharaoh was saying no, God was working and hardening his heart. And when he finally said yes after the 10th plague, they not only got to leave, but they left with the whole wealth of Egypt. Oh, some of you missed it. Right now, you've been getting a no answer, and you're thinking, well, I failed, I need to quit, I need to give up. No, you just stay in there, because God's working behind the scenes, and you might gotta know once, you gotta, might not have gotta know twice, but he's working something out, and you're gonna plunder the enemy right here. Yeah. Stay with it. God is setting you up. Maybe you're, you're believing for healing. We were talking about that, and I believe people are gonna be healed and delivered today. But maybe you've been believing for healing, and it just seems like, no, it fails, it fails. Hey, you just stay in there. You believe the word, and I'm telling you, it's gonna come to pass in your life. What I've learned is this. You must have a war mentality and not a battle mentality. You gotta have a war mentality and not a battle mentality because a lot of times we might look like we've lost the battle but the war's not over yet. You read the history books and when in World War II, the first battle didn't go very well for the United States. Pearl Harbor, it didn't look good and there was probably a lot of people that wanted to quit but there was a great nation that raised up, a great nation of people that rose up and said, we believe God and, and he's gonna deliver us and we won the war. You might be fighting some battles and it looks like it's over, but God's up there and he's going, do over. I've got you. You just keep showing up. You just stay faithful and watch God come to pass in your life. Can you say amen to that? So I begin to look at this and I saw it all over the Bible. God was taking me everywhere. Let's go to the New Testament. Go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. 
And Jesus is telling uh, several parables in this chapter, and he gets down to the parable of the lost son, or what we would call the prodigal son. How many remember that story? So this father has two sons, and the youngest one says, hey, I I want you to divide the inheritance that belongs to me because I don't wanna stay here anymore. I I really wish you had already have died. I I want my money now because I think I can do better with it. I know none of us have ever been like that. But he says, I I want it. And so he decides he's gonna go off and he's gonna enjoy life and do it his way. But how many of you know, when you start doing things your way, it might start off good for a little while, but your life will soon spiral out of control. Sin will always take you further than you wanna go. And he begins to go out and he goes to a foreign country and he begins to live in prodigal living. And I had to look that word up. And that word prodigal, it is, it is an excessive lifestyle. It is godly and immoral. It's wildly extravagant. And he blows all of the money that he had and he ends up starving to death and he, he's joined and worked for a farmer and he's feeding the pigs and he's in the pig pen and he's longing to eat what they're eating. He's at the bottom. And we pick up this passage right here. Luke chapter 15, verse 17. And this is one of my favorite phrases. It says, but when he came to himself, I'm telling you, your life might be spiraling out of control, but you need a moment where you come to yourself and you say, I don't want this anymore. I don't need to live this way anymore. I need to come back. I need to get back to my father. And it says, he came to himself and he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I'm perishing with hunger? And then he says this, he says, I will arise and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, and he begins to practice his speech. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer even worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And then he arose, come on, say he arose. Do over, he arose and he came to his father. But get this, but when he was still a great way off, his father was looking down the road and most of us have a picture of God like this. (sighs) Yeah, here he comes. Man, I told you so. And we view God that he's just there to punish you when you mess up. Because a lot of times our own self-talk is the one that's that critical and we're beating ourselves up. And a lot of times your self-talk will keep you from coming to yourself and rising back up. But he went back and his father wasn't looking there with judgment. His father saw him a long way off and it says, and he ran. Come on, say he ran. He had compassion on him and he ran and he fell on his neck and kissed him. He ran to restore his son, not to judge his son. You take one step back to God and he comes running. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If you'll just come to yourself and say, I'm done with that life, I'm done with that habit, I'm done with that way of thinking, and you take one step back to God, he comes running to restore you. This father loved him, had compassion He wasn't there to say, you just blew it. He was there to say, I got a do-over for you. Just come back. Verse 21, and the said said, son, he begins to say his, his speech that he's practiced, and he said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And if you go back, he had more to the speech, but God stopped him right there. The father stopped him and said, before he could work his way back into favor, he said, I'm gonna restore you back into favor. You can't work your way back into favor. You just gotta come to the father and let him restore you back into favor. The father stopped him and he said, bring out the best robe and put it on him. In fact, one version says, quickly, Before he gets even further in his speech, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Get this, for this son of mine that was dead is alive again. Come on, shout do over. (laughs) He is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they began to be merry. The father ran to restore him. 
But you know what? God showed me another picture of this. And he asked this question, why did the father run? And then he said this, he also ran because he had to beat the older brother from getting there first. Because what would the older brother have done? You worthless guy, I knew you were gonna blow it. You've been ungrateful, you've been unthankful, and now you're coming back to just get more of the family money. The father had to run to beat him from getting there because you know what? God doesn't want us judging people. And what this character, Jesus really brings this character into play and what that character really represents are the religious people who hasn't necessarily done the mistakes that this guy's done, but they have sin in their own life. They're being judgmental, they're being critical, they're being unloving, unforgiving. And I've seen that a lot. You know, I, I used to, at one time in my life, I carried a, a rock in my pocket. And on this rock, there was a number painted on it and it said number one. And what it stood for was the first. Because what I would remember is when the lady was caught in adultery and they had rocks to stone her, Jesus speaks up and he says, he who is without sin, you cast the first stone. So I carried in my pocket the first stone because it always reminded me, hey, I've been in a pit also. And they need forgiveness just like I needed forgiveness. And I'm not gonna be the one that's gonna throw the stone. I'm gonna be the one just like the father that welcomes them in and he gets them mercy that they need. There's a lot of people that you've had some church hurt in your life because they judged you, criticized you, cast you out. But I want you to know this house is a house of love. It's a house of forgiveness. And we click quickly remember, hey, if not for the grace of God, there go I. I was in that pit too, but the Father ran to me. And we're gonna help you in this situation. And we're gonna help you walk out of this situation because we have the love and compassion of the Father. Can I hear an amen in the house today? I, I wanna bring this even to a more realistic thing. How many has ever been driving down the highway? and you're going the speed limit, or some of you are probably going a little bit over the speed limit, and you're driving along, and all of a sudden, another car passes you, just screaming by you, and I mean, just flying by. And have you ever had this thought, or you said this, man, I sure hope there's a police officer up there that catches them. <laughs> yeah, I can tell by the laugh, some of you did that this morning. <laughs> But you know what, we, we may have an air of, well, I, you know, I just want safety, but a lot of times we just want someone to get caught and punished for what they're doing because they're not doing it the way we want them to do it. Oh, come on, it's quiet in this church today. Do we have love and compassion and forgiveness? And, and do we, when they scream by us, instead of saying, man, I sure hope they get caught, Lord, please protect them and save them and bring them to a saving knowledge of you. Are we quick to love and forgive or are we quick to judge and criticize? Man, I love this story. The father was looking, waiting, and when he saw the son, he come running with compassion, love, and mercy. That's our God. Come on, say, that's my God. Another story that God brought me to was Nehemiah when he was rebuilding the wall, and if you want to, you can turn over to Nehemiah chapter two, and and. Jerusalem had been overtaken and it had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. The walls had all been taken down. In fact, they burned the gates so they could never use those again. And then they took the walls of the, or the, the bricks of the wall and they put them in a, just a big old pile of rubbish and they tried to burn them and they were trying to not use those again. And so the temple had been built, rebuilt about 70 years before, but the walls were still down. And Nehemiah gets vision. He says, uh, you know, I want to pray that God restores this. Come on, this is a house of restoration. And we need to see a situation out there and begin to pray, God, use me in the restoration of this place. And so he begins to pray and God tells him to go back and he has favor and he's got letters to give him wood to, to rebuild. And so he goes back in Nehemiah chapter two, verse 17. He says, then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies in waits and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. 
You know, isn't it amazing we can be in a place of reproach or a bad situation for so long that we don't even realize we're in it anymore? Nehemiah, with a fresh perspective, came in and said, hey, this isn't the way it should be. Let's rebuild. Let's not be a reproach anymore. And, and so God's gonna use some of you as an instigation of rebuilding, an instigation of restoration, if you'll be willing. The walls had been down. They're still in piles of rubbish. Nehemiah chapter two, verse 18 says, and he told them of the hand of, uh, the hand of my God, which has been good upon me, and also the king's words that has spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. But anytime you start a good work, how many know the enemy's gonna show up and try to shut it down? And Nehemiah chapter four, this begins to happen. Verse one, but as it happened when Sanballat, Aren't you glad mama didn't name you Sanballat? When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Now listen to this. Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? the stones that are burned. And I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost stopped me right there. And he says, the, these piles of stones over there, the enemy tried to burn them so that they would never be used again. But you know what? There's a lot of us that have been burnt in our life. We've been cast out as in a rubble pile and the enemy's tried to burn you so bad that you'll never be used again. But I wanna tell you today, God still used burned stones to build the wall. They're in there and they're covered with soot. They're covered with ashes and they don't think that they could ever be used again. But God sees that and he says, nope, I have a purpose and I have a plan for them. And you know what? You may have been burned by your family. You may have been burned at work. You may have been burned by a, a whole lot of other things. You might have been discarded into a rubbish pile. But God says, it's not over. There's a do-over I have for you and it's time for you to rise up because I need you in the wall. Some of you say, well, they burned me. I don't ever wanna come back. We need you. We've got to have you. This church needs you. Because if there's one brick missing in the wall, it makes the wall weaker. We need you in your purpose. We need you in your plan. It's time for you to rise up, shake off that dust and ashes and say, I might have been burned, but I've got a do-over coming and I'm gonna be used by God and the enemy can't stop me. Come on, say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we started with Moses. I wanna wrap up with Moses because there was another major event that happened. Moses Again, on the mountain, God told him, he says, I'm gonna give you my 10 commandments. Some of you have seen the movie, but let me tell you, the book is always better. <laughs> but he's given him these 10 commandments. You could call these 10 keys to a wonderful world. Come on, how many of you know, if we follow the 10 commandments, it's gonna be a wonderful world. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor Ty, we don't have the 10 commandments anymore. We're New Testament. Well, Jesus just took all 10 of those and he wrapped them up into two. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Let me just tell you, if you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not gonna lie about them. You're not gonna steal from them. You're not gonna sleep with their wife. You're not gonna kill them. Come on, how many know he just wrapped it up and he said, hey, the keys to a successful life, the keys to a wonderful world is obey my word, do the things because I've already laid it out. It's a perfect plan if we'll just do it. So Moses gets this assignment to bring down the 10 commandments. And so he's got that. Now, now get this, we're gonna read it here in just a second, but God himself cut these tablets of stone out. He cut them out himself. And so I want you to read this, Exodus 32, verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony they were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides and on one side and on the other side they were written. 
Now the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on tablets. In fact, Exodus 31, 18 says they were written with the finger of God himself. Come on, how many of you know that's some precious archeological stuff right there? The other day, we were doing some decorating and some cleaning at our house, getting ready for the holidays, and my wife had me carry this crystal bowl, and it's a heavy crystal bowl. And I'm telling you, when I had that in my hands, I was walking very carefully. Because my wife's a lovely lady, but if I dropped that, things would change right there. (laughs) I was being very deliberate and very careful because I knew it was precious, and I didn't want to break it. So Moses has something cut out by God, written on by the hand of God, and he begins down the mountain. In verse 17, it says, and when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is the noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, no, it's not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but it's the sound of singing I hear. So as soon as it was, they came near the camp, they saw the golden calf. Now let's stop right here for a second. This golden calf, Moses had led them out of the land of Egypt. And now he's been up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And the people said, I don't know what's happened to this guy, Moses. I think he's gone. I think God killed him. Aaron, we need you to make us a God to go before us. So they gave him all their gold jewelry. And Aaron fashions this golden calf. And he presents it to the people and he says, behold, this is the God who led you out of Israel. In fact, or out of Egypt. And you know what the word God was there? It's Elohim, the one ultimate true God. They quickly substituted the power of God for something they could see, feel, and touch. They quickly turned from a God that miraculously delivered him. Come on, I'm talking to someone in here. God's done some major things in some of you's life, but you've turned your back and it's time to come back to him. So they begin to sing and dance and party around this calf. And look what happens, verse 19, Exodus 32. So it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot. Come on, say, anger became hot. In one fit of anger, in one fit of... Do I need to go back to the highway for a second? Come on, how many of you have been driving down 169 and someone cut you off and in a flash, anger rises up? In one bit of anger, he flashed with this anger And it says, he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Guys, we all know this story, but I want you to get the the depth of it. These were created, they were cut out by God and written with God's finger. And in one bit of anger, he throws them down and breaks them at the foot of the mountain. Now, Now we've all broken the 10 commandments, but not literally. This was big. A huge call, a huge assignment. And in one bit of anger, he seemingly threw it all away. And some of you in here have maybe done the same thing. In one bit of anger, you've lashed out. One bit of anger, you've quit a job and a career that you know God has called you to be in. And it's time for a do-over. Come on, say, I need a do-over. So look at what happens. Exodus chapter 34, verse one. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. God cut out the first one, but now he's making Moses cut out the second ones. He says, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. (laughs) I mean, you know, God has a sense of humor. You broke them, you're gonna cut them out and I'm gonna write on them again, but it's gonna be on you now. But how many of you know, man, this is so powerful. He didn't have to come up with a whole new plan. He says, I'm gonna rewrite the plan. I got a do over and you're gonna cut out the tablets and I'm gonna rewrite the plan on it. Oh, that was a word for some of you. 
you needed a do-over. And he says, I don't have to come up with a plan B. I'm going to keep it back on plan A. Verse 2. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to the Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain, neither let flocks nor herds feed before the mountain. Man, I, I tell you, I don't know about you, but right now I'd be a little bit panicked. God's saying, okay, I want you to come up on the mountain. I don't want anyone to come with you. I don't even want the cattle or the sheep to see what I'm about to do. God didn't want any witnesses. <laughs> and I'm sure he's thinking, oh, he's gonna wipe me out. I blew it. He trusted me and I blew it. God's gonna just wipe me off of the face of the planet. But he had enough to say, God, I trust you. So verse four, Moses cut out the two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. And I'm sure each step, he's a little bit nervous. But listen to verse five closely. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. I'm telling you, so many times in my life I've blown it and I just wanted to get away. I just wanted to be by myself. And he is in a moment that he doesn't know how God's gonna react. And God says, I'm gonna just come down and I'm gonna stand with you there. Someone, you feel like God's done with you. But he's right in this place. And he's saying, I'm gonna stand with you here. I'm gonna be with you and I'm never gonna leave you and I'm never gonna forsake you. And then listen to what God says about himself. And the, la the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I'm telling you, God says, I'm not gonna rub you out. I'm gonna come down there and I'm gonna be with you and I'm gonna show you how merciful and how loving and how gracious I am. You may be here today and the story looks like it's over. But God's crying over you, do over. It's not over. I'm gonna rewrite your story. You might think it's over, but it's not. Trust me. God gave me four keys to a do-over or to a wonderful world. Here's the first one. You gotta look up. Moses' head was down, he was in failure. And a lot of times our head gets down and we wanna beat ourselves up. We, our self-talk wants to tell us how critical we are, but you gotta look up. I gotta tell you a story. I haven't told this in any of the other services. You're getting a free one right here. But I love to work with wood out in the, the garage, the shop. I'm not very good at it, but I like to work out there. And there's been several times that I, I've, glued and, and screwed two pieces of wood that were supposed to be together, but what I forgot is there was something supposed to go on it before I screwed it together. How many's ever done that? And one time I did that and I glued it and put it together and I forgot the piece that was supposed to go on before and I'm telling you, I was like, oh, man, that was stupid. That was, I was the only one out there, but I was like giving it to myself. Man, that was dumb, man. And all of a sudden, my wife come busting out of the back door and she said, hey, don't talk to my husband that way. Some of you are your worst critic and your head's always down and you're always beating yourself up. Hey, key number one, you need to look up. It's God that's gonna bring your help. It's God that's gonna bring you out of this. Point number two, get up. Just like the prodigal son, he had to come to the end of his place and come to the end of himself, but he says, I'm gonna arise. You're gonna have to get up out of that place. You're gonna have to take a step back, but when you take one step, the father comes running. Point number three, you're gonna have to dust off. 
You might be in a pile of rubbish. You might have been burned and you got ashes and soot on you, but you got to shake that off. You might have had some real reason to be in that pile. You might have had some real things that have happened, but I've got to turn, I've got to learn to get forgiveness, shake myself off and keep going. Some of you are just hanging out in that place, hanging out. And it's time to get back up and dust yourself off. And then point number four, you gotta keep going. The apostle Paul wrote this, forgetting those things that lie behind, I press towards the goal of the upward call. I gotta keep going, I can't quit, I can't give up because even though it looks like I might have been defeated, do over, God's got my comeback. Can I hear an amen today? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, and you need a do-over in your life. Seeming like you failed in some situations. It seems like it's over. It seems like you might think you're too old. But God says, nope, I've got a do-over for you. If you need healing or a breakthrough in your life, and it doesn't look like it's gonna come, God says, no, my word still works. It's still powerful. Just choose to believe. Maybe you're here and you're a burnt stone and you've been cast into a pile of rubble. It's time to come up. Or maybe you're like the prodigal son. You belong to Jesus, you love Jesus, but maybe you've walked away and you've been living your own life. Or maybe you've never made that decision. Today's the day. If I'm talking to you right now and you need to come to Jesus or you need to come to Jesus, come back to Jesus, wherever you're at, right where you sit, I want you to raise your hand right there. I want you to raise it high. Yeah, I see hands going up. And all of the other ones, you need a comeback. You need a do-over. You need something that's seeming like you failed, but you need a reset. You need a do-over in your life right now. It looks like everything's falling apart, but God's speaking over to you today. No, I've got a do-over for you. Just believe me. If I'm talking to you, I want you to raise your hand with those that already have all over the place. Come on, raise them high. Come on, raise them high. This is your moment. I need a breakthrough. I need a miracle in my life. It may look like it's over, but I'm believing God for a do-over. Come on, if that's you. Yeah, hands going up everywhere. I want everyone to stand to your feet right where you're at. And if you raised your hand on any of those, or you know you should have raised your hand, you need a do-over in your life. You need a reset. You need healing. You need restoration. You need to come back to Jesus right where you're at. I want you to get out of your seats. I want you to come to the front. We got people that are going to be here to pray for you. We're going to stand and believe with you. Come on, as they're coming, give it up for them. Come on, give them a hand. Yes. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your
Come on, aren't you glad we serve a faithful, faithful God? Now we're gonna pray over all these situations and all the things you come up for. But the first thing we're gonna do, there were several that raised their hand that they're either making a commitment to God or they're coming back to God. You know, I was saved at 12. But my whole high school, college, young adult age, I completely walked away. I still loved him. I still come to church on a regular basis, but I was living my life, much like the prodigal son. And you can love him and you can come to church and still not be serving him and him still not be Lord. So maybe you're here and maybe you didn't even come up or you're watching us online and you need to pray this prayer. Today, we're gonna make a prayer of commitment that he is not just savior, but he's truly Lord of our life. So I'm gonna lead us and I want everyone in the room, those watching online, repeat it with me. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're the son of God, that you came to earth to die for my sins. I believe you were buried in the grave and that God raised you from the dead. And I receive you now as my savior. And I make you now Lord of all of my life. Lord, I thank you that I might have been knocked back, but I'm not knocked out. And you've got my comeback. And I thank you, Lord. Now fill me with your spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you prayed that, you are born again. And your best days are right in front of you. Now I'm gonna pray a general prayer and you've got people that are behind you that are gonna pray with you. But Lord, I thank you for every person here and watching online that it looked like it was over, it looked like failure, it looked like defeat. But God, we hear you crying out over us, do over! And Lord, it may look like it's over, but we're coming back strong. And we're gonna be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Lord, I thank you that you that began a good work, you're faithful to complete it. And I pray over someone right now that says it's too late for me. No, it's never too late. You might've been burned, you might've been cast out, but it's not too late. I, I know I'm talking to someone online, you don't quit, you don't give up. God's got a purpose and a plan for your life. Lord, I just thank you that we've heard the word, but now we have to make a choice that we're gonna believe the word and walk in the word. So Lord, I thank you that it's you that give us the second chance. It's you that give us the victory. And Lord, I thank you just like Moses. We might have to go back several times, but God, we're gonna take the wealth of the wicked with us. And Father, we just thank you for it right now in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone agrees, say amen.